We're so pleased to join the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate in hosting this event and this debate between candidates for the office of the United States Senate from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. With the continued development of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute and the construction of their facility on this campus, we look forward to, and you should come to expect, this kind of collaboration and these kinds of events that keep citizens of our city and our commonwealth immersed in the critical issues of the day that affect the lives of people and direct the course of our nation and this world. We are proud to be Boston's public research university out here on this beautiful peninsula. Our work here at the University of Massachusetts Boston is one that focuses on our public mission and promotes the well-being of the city, the commonwealth, and the nation, as well as the globe. Therefore, it only makes sense for us to be engaged in facilitating and promoting an event that aids in advancing civic responsibility, increasing civic information, and deepening civic participation. As an institution of higher education with a public charter, the University of Massachusetts Boston is committed to and driven by the notion of an intelligent and informed public as a critical element of a truly functioning democracy. The only counterbalance to the distancing of our political processes from the people by special or wealth-bearing interests is a knowledgeable, energized and empowered public. That's why we've opened our doors of this majestic ballroom to all of you tonight. That is why you have come to this beautiful peninsula. That is why these three candidates have agreed to allow their intellectual and political iron to, in a sustainable way, participate in the ongoing effort of our nation to strengthen our democracy and to form a more perfect union. Thank you, candidates Brown, Coakley, and Kennedy for your willingness to share yourselves with us tonight. Thank you to the organizers for your hard work in pulling this event together for us tonight. And thank you all for your presence, which communicates to us all your concern and attentiveness to our larger community. Now I have the unbelievable pleasure of in just introducing you to some, and but also welcoming to the stage for many, the president and CEO of Edward M. Kennedy Institute to greet you all, Peter Meek. We caught Peter, he was uh, moonlighting a little bit after 12 years as Executive Vice President of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we're so grateful for his presidents out here on this peninsula. Peter Mead, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, to my dear friend, Dr. Motley, we want to thank UMass. Our cousins from the BBC are here as well, and we thank them. The photographers will be leaving momentarily. We don't have a great deal of time. Just quick rules, please. No sounds from the audience. No applauding, no other size, those kinds of things. It just takes away from the candidates. We're here to hear from the candidates. So please, let's do that. Let me invite the candidates to come out on the stage right now. And let me also, as they are coming out, introduce our moderator for tonight. The Edward Kennedy Institute is so proud to be participating in this at the University of Massachusetts. David Gergen, as many of you know, is the director of the Center for Public Leadership and professor of public service at the Harvard Kennedy School. He also served a number of presidents, both Republicans and Democrats, and we're delighted that he will be our moderator. So if I could please have the candidates come to the stage and then have David Gergen come out, we will begin on time. Thank you very much. Good evening, good evening. Good evening, I'm David Gergen, and I want to welcome all of you uh, to this closing debate among the candidates for next week's election to the United States Senate. This coming Tuesday will be a crucial time here in Massachusetts. 
voters will go to the poll and select a person who may well determine the outcome of the long fight over health care legislation in Washington. At stake as well will be jobs, energy, the environment, abortion, wars overseas. We have much to talk about tonight. Moreover, the candidates in this election are seeking to fill a seat that is legendary in American politics. Among its occupants have been giants of the past, from Teddy Kennedy and his brother John, to Henry Cabot Lodge, Charles Sumner, Daniel Webster, and John Quincy Adams. Those are some shoes to fill. So we, this debate is sponsored by the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. We are gathered at the Boston campus of the University of Massachusetts, on whose land the Kennedy Institute will eventually be built. In an order determined by lottery, let me introduce the three candidates here with us. Scott Brown, the Republican candidate, is in his third term in the state Senate, representing the Norfolk, Bristol, and Middlesex district. He previously served three terms in the House. Martha Coakley, the Democratic candidate, is the Attorney General of Massachusetts. She was elected in 2006 after serving eight years as District Attorney of Middlesex County. Joseph Kennedy, no relation to the late Senator, is an independent candidate who is a member of the National Libertarian Party. He works in information technology and lives in Dedham. In preparing questions, I've consulted with members of the media and with other people whose judgment I trust. The questions themselves are known only to me. To the audience, once again, please hold your applause until the end. We will begin with a series of questions to the candidates, leaving time in each round for response and discussion. By lottery, the first question will go to Mr. Brown, then to Ms. Coakley, then Mr. Kennedy, and we'll rotate the order. Later on, the candidates will have time to ask each other questions. So, let us begin. To the candidates, President, President Obama and Democrats in Congress are now in the final stages of hammering out a national health care bill. There is a very real possibility that the winner of this election will be in a position to ensure passage of the bill or its defeat. Do you want voters in Massachusetts to see next Tuesday's vote as a referendum on this national health care bill? Mr. Brown. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Kennedy Institute and UMass Boston. Uh, thank you for your question. The health care bill that's being proposed in Washington is broken. Uh, the backroom deals, uh, Nebraska, Louisiana, we all know about it. We need to start over. We have health care here already in Massachusetts. Ninety-eight percent of the people are already insured. We've done it. Did it with the help of the Senate president and others. Uh, so we don't need what's being pushed on Washington on Massachusetts. Cutting half a trillion dollars from Medicare, you're going to look at longer lines, lesser coverage. We know we need to reform pricing. It's something we're going to be doing very shortly. But to think that we're going to have a one-size-fits-all plan in, in uh, in Congress going to come down here in, in Massachusetts and hurt what we have. That's one of the differences between Martha Coakley and I. You're talking about a trillion dollar uh, health care plan, uh, half a trillion dollars of Medicare cuts uh, at a time when we just don't need it. I would propose actually going and allowing the states to do it individually with the government incentivizing it. Very similar to what we did here. We can actually export out what we've done and show them how to do it. So I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to uh, be the 41st vote and make sure that we get uh, uh, that plan back to the drawing board. Ms. Coakley. Thank you, David, and thanks for hosting us here this evening. I'd be proud to be the 60th vote to make sure that we get health care reform that we so badly need. We've taken the lead here in Massachusetts in getting everybody insured, and now we are attacking costs to make sure that we provide for transparency and competition to bring costs down. We now spend $2.6 trillion a year on health care in this country. We do not get our money's worth. We do not have transparency, competition. We do not have, for the money we spend now, the kinds of health care that we can and should have. As Senator Kennedy said, it should be a right, not a privilege. I believe that we can, by passing health care in Washington and doing it incrementally, as apparently we are going to do, we will set the groundwork for a revolutionary way in which we provide for coverage, for those who can't get coverage now, pre-existing injuries, and make sure that we keep costs down and people can keep the health care they have. 
costs are going up at 8 to 10 percent, the status quo is simply unsustainable. Mr. Kennedy. Uh, the health care bill that's going on in Washington is a travesty. And as much as I would like to think that there will be a 41st vote against it, which I would love to be, the reality is we are seeing votes bought. Every single time this bill has gone through office, we have seen another person fail because it has bought, been bought. The issue today is not whether who is going to vote down health care. Health care will pass. It will be bought for because of the politics, as usual, going on in Washington. The question is, who is going to work to repeal it once it passes? We have an issue going on today in government, uh, and the issue is that government is too big. This bill will cost $1.2 trillion. So to explain what that number means, every year our federal income taxes is only $1.1 trillion for every single person in America. What that means is an 11% increase on everyone at minimum to pay for this bill. We can't afford it. We shouldn't do it. Health care in Massachusetts is going up rapidly, and it will at the government level as well. Okay. <clears throat> Please, Mr. Brown, you wanted to follow up. Thank you, David. We, we have insurance here in Massachusetts. We have some of the best doctors, nurses, hospitals in the country. That's why people actually come here. Uh, not only this, is this bill going to be bad uh, for our state, my job is to be the, the senator from Massachusetts. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, really subsidizing what we'll be doing for the next, uh, pick, pick a number, three, four, five years. We will be subsidizing what other states had failed to do. Um, do you agree with that, Mr. Copley? Oh, and I, I spoke to a woman on the campaign trail whose husband's out of work. She doesn't have health care. She has two children who have pre-existing injuries, very rare diseases that even doctors in Massachusetts can't address. And even though the doctors refer her to specialists elsewhere in the country, the insurance companies won't pay for it. This system is broken. Massachusetts will benefit with $500 million closing the donut hole for prescriptions for seniors. It's a good plan for Massachusetts. Uh, why is it not a bad plan? It, it's it's a bad not? plan because it's going to hurt jobs in a time when we can't afford to why, lose why, jobs. Can explain it. Why is that? Why is it going to lose jobs? Why, why because we have a competing plan. If the government option goes and uh, they have that in effect, it's directly going to compete with the plans that we already have. We've taken great care to make sure that we have fantastic plans, hands, uh, plans here from the uh, so-called plans that union members were getting, businesses, down to the uh, Commonwealth Care subsidized plans. But the, the biggest problem, and Martha talked about the $500 million that Senator Kerry is bringing back, we shouldn't have to go to Washington every time to you know, have a, a, a cup to, to get handouts from Washington. We should be able to fix the problems on our own, and we can do that uh, very easily. Yeah, Ms. Cookley, can you promise the voters of Massachusetts, if you're elected, you're going you're gonna to vote for this national health care plan, regardless of how it's changed here in conference, especially on abortion? I, I think the plan, what I've said is that I support the plan coming out of the Senate. Right. And so I, what if it gets, becomes more restrictive as in the House, the Stupak Amendment? I've said I, wouldn't, I would not vote for a plan that has Stupak pits in it. So you, would, you would then become the 41st senator against it? I don't believe that's going to be the choice. I think it's okay. pretty clear from what everybody said that that won't be but the But you'll only bill. vote for the Senate bill? I'll vote for the Senate bill or some reasonable facsimile of it. Right. Excuse, excuse me. It's not going to be the Senate bill. As you know, it's in conference committee now. It's going to come out. The bill is going to be a compromise. And bottom line is, regardless of what version comes out, this bill is not good for Massachusetts. Yeah. It's going to cost us jobs. It's going to cost us very real jobs at a time when we cannot afford it. But Mr. Brown, let me ask you this question that's on a lot of people's minds. This, this, you've said you're for health care reform, just not this bill. Right. Uh, we know from the Clinton experience that if this bill fails, it could well be another 15 years uh, before we see health care reform efforts again in Washington. Are you willing under those circumstances to say, I'm going to be the person? I'm going to sit in Teddy Kennedy's seat, and I'm going to be the person that's going to block it for another 15 years? Well, with all due respect, it's not the Kennedy seat, and it's not the Democrat seat. It's okay. the people's seat. And uh, they have a chance to send somebody down there who's going to be an independent voter and an independent thinker and going to look out for the best interests of the people of Massachusetts. Right. And the way that this bill is configured, I'd like to send them back to the drawing board because I believe people should have insurance, not just this particular bill, because it's not good for the entire country. You're talking about an additional trillion dollars of cost, a half a trillion dollars of Medicare cuts. Uh, m military people, if you're veterans, you're going to have effects, uh, cuts, in, uh, cuts in TRICARE. And it's not good. We need to go back to the drawing board. Nobody has confidence in this bill right now. All right. Let me ask Ms. Uh, Coakley a final question here. Mr. Kennedy, if you want to jump in, I welcome you. Uh, Ms. Coakley, this morning, the head of the AFL-CIO, Richard Trumka, uh, said that it would be a recipe for disaster uh, if the final health care bill includes a tax on high-end insurance plans, what's in the Senate bill. Senator Obama says he is for that tax on high-end uh, uh, plans. 
you've got labor support, you've got your president in the other position, where do you come down on that? Well, the president also said that he thought there was a lot of room to determine what exactly was going to be in those Cadillac plans. Right. Maybe the broad, the net should include a couple Toyotas or something, and, and so it would not be uh, as the current definition. Right. I don't okay. agree with it, and I think there are different ways that we can pay for that plan. A brief intervention. We're going to Dave, I mean, this isn't about cars, it's about health care. And uh, the plan that we're talking about here, it is going to be taxing uh, those Cadillac plans, so-called, for good union members who have fought so hard through f uh, good faith bargaining to get those plans. In addition to that, um, how are you going to pay for this? You're cutting a half a trillion dollars out of Medicare. You're also uh, going to be taxing people at a time that they just can't afford it. We can do better. We can go dr back to the drawing board, and I don't think it's going to take 15 years. Not on my watch. I'm going to make it a priority to make sure that we have a form of coverages that states can rely on and have the flexibility to be part of. Not a one-size-fits-all for the entire country at the, at the uh, at really hurting states and their individual uh, rights to you know, free market and free enterprise. Yeah, I, I'm going to turn to you, Ms. Coakley, for, and you can, you can wind your answer in, but I, I, all of you have talked about the economy, and voters in this Commonwealth, of course, put jobs right at the top of their list. Everyone's worried about 10 percent unemployment nationwide. But it's also true that this terrible economic situation that workers find themselves in really comes at the end of a lost decade for American workers. There has been nationwide no net job growth since December 1999, and middle-class families, when adjusted for inflation, have not seen their incomes rise. What are your plans, not only short-term, but what's the answer to the long-term challenge for jobs for Americans? Well, workers? exactly, and if I can just note that the Congressional Budget Office says that within 10 years that health care plan will be deficit neutral, and one of the reasons that we've had the issues that we have now are because during the last decade we haven't had um, uh, regulations that have kept the economy in check on Wall Street with predatory lending, uh, with a Bush-Cheney tax policy that supported the haves and the have-mores in this uh, society. And by the way, that's what Scott Brown still wants to do is return to. Uh, he wants to go back to the drawing board. He does indeed. He wants to go back to those Bush-Cheney policies that provide for the very wealthiest. I've supported and I've said I support a plan that will provide tax relief for the middle class, that will allow middle-class families to keep more money in their paychecks, to provide for tax credits for college, to provide for tax credits and more lending opportunities for small businesses, which will be the engine that will get this economy, particularly in the Bay State, moving again. Ms. Kennedy. David, real wages have not risen in America since 1972. So it's not just the last 10 years. We've lost the last 40 years. So what we need to do is we need to get the economy going. And the way that we do that is we cut spending. Harding did it back in the 20s. We haven't done it since. We continue to increase government programs. We continue to spend money on wars. We continue to spend money on entitlement plans. These things draw money from the private sector into the public sector. And year after year after year, we see the public sector growing. We see people not getting real wage increases. That's just what is going on. Until people are willing to actually cut spending, cut entitlements, and stop going to war around the world, which is extremely, extremely expensive, we are not going to fix this economy. There is no way, shape, or form. We have hack jobs up in government. We have a number of bureaucracies up in government. We have wasteful spending up in government, and nobody is holding them accountable. Somebody needs to stop the wars. Somebody needs to hold back the entitled pro entitlement programs, and somebody needs to give the money back to the taxpayer. Excuse me. Right, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, Congressional bu Budget Office is going to take 10 years. So for, we're going to be paying for our plan. We're going to be basically subsidizing other states for the next four or five years, and eventually we're going to break even. Well, that sounds like a real bargain, I'll tell you. I'd rather send it back to the drawing board. And uh, regarding tax cuts, there's no one who's listening right now that believes, Martha, that you are the tax-cutting candidate. I have a history of cutting taxes, holding the line on spending. I've been up there with the Band of Brothers fighting on, on Beacon Hill against the, the machine who wants to raise your taxes, Governor Patrick and everybody else, and uh, we can do better in that regard. And regarding your comments consistently about Bush Cheney this, Bush Cheney that, uh, you, can, you can run against Bush Cheney, but uh, I'm Scott Brown. I live in Rentham. I drive a truck. And yes, it's over 200, it's 200,000 miles on it now. And uh, you're not running against them, you're running against me. And the big <laughs> difference between you and me is that you want to raise taxes 2.1 trillion per the Congressional Budget Office on items that you, in fact, were very, very uh, 
uh, vocal about during the primary. Nothing's changed. And if it's not 2.1 trillion, what's the actual number that you want to raise people's taxes? And, and if I may respond, Please. Scott, it doesn't matter how many times you say 2.1 trillion, it doesn't make it accurate or even uh, well, close what's, to being accurate. The no, there isn't a number. What's the number? It isn't a number because what I support are, in fact, relief for the middle class. The, the cuts that President Obama supports for the middle class, a health care plan that will be self-supporting. Your response to health care costs is to make sure that we let insurance companies not provide for mammograms and cervical screening and hospital, hospice care for seniors. So that's not a good way to go if we want real health care reform. We have an energy policy that will make polluters pay. Uh, and those numbers then disappear. So we're down to zero. Scott, you're the one who voted while you were in the Senate for over $7 billion of spending in the Commonwealth. You voted for $300 million of fees. So let's get that rhetoric and reality straight. I'm not tax and spend. I've been a very conservative and a very fiscally responsible attorney general. I brought back a billion dollars to the Commonwealth as attorney general. Excuse me. Please. Once again, there's no one watching that thinks you're a tax cutter. And uh, I've never voted for a, a tax increase while in elective office. And I'm very proud of fighting the line on taxes. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the items that you're talking about, I think, is quite frankly outrageous that you would say that I would not be uh, supportive of women's rights and protecting mammogram coverages. Of course, we're going to have basic coverages in all of our health plans that we're proposing. When we refer mandates and look at them to save money, that's very important. But the health care bill that you're pushing in Washington, and you will support, and you've said it, in fact, raises the age of getting mammogram coverages from 40 to 50. It sets limits on pap smear testing. It cuts a half a trillion dollars from seniors for Medicare. I think they're going to be hurt quite a bit more than having the connector authority review mandates to make sure that we don't have to think chiropractic care is a mandated thing. Just because people have good lobbyists up, in, up at Beacon Hill, we can do better with the plan that we have. We don't need to rely right. on a plan in, in uh, Washington to, to fix Brief our plan. Sure. Yeah, we, we can agree to disagree, Scott, but let's be clear on the facts. And you can't distort my record and not be accurate about your own. I haven't proposed any new taxes except for those on the wealthiest top 2% of the country. That's all I've ever said. That's all I've talked about. So let's be clear on the facts. What I propose is going forward to making sure we can afford for health care. We can't afford it now. It's 8 to 10% a year going up. Yeah. David, excuse me. You, you're in favor of cap and trade, which is a national energy tax. It's You've a said tax. It's, a it's, it's, a, it's a tax. It's not a tax. <laughs> You're, you're in favor of a health care bill that's going to be about a trillion dollars. That's a tax Budget increase. Budget neutral. And it's going to cut uh, Medicare by half a trillion dollars. You're in favor of the expiring tax cuts to actually inspire that the marriage penalty is coming back. Okay. The, uh, excuse me, the, uh, I don't mean to be rude, but I just want to say the uh, child care right. tax I, I credit you're, you're is rude. coming back. Oh. And, uh, there's, so, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that's I all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, listen, I hear you all talking a lot about tax cuts to create jobs and the importance of that. But it, there's a second issue out there that's looming, that is called the deficits. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the truth of the matter is that just over the horizon are these massive deficits. We've not only 1.4 trillion now, but every year in the next 10 years, the Obama administration, we're going to have says we're going to have a trillion dollars more of deficits. If we're going to cut taxes, and not, and, not cut spend, and, not, and not cut spending very much. How are we going to solve this problem? And the first answer goes to Mr. Kennedy. Yeah, the, the answer here is, and I've been saying it the, this entire candidacy, nobody to my right has been willing to talk about spending cuts. And everybody who says that... What would you cut? What would I cut? Yeah. Uh, I don't think we have enough time, but I'm going to <laughs> cut... I'm going to cut, you know, Obamacare when it passes. I am going to cut the Department of Education. I'm going to cut every single hack job that is out there uh, that exists today. I will audit the Federal Reserve, and I will see to it that if there is corruption in the Federal Reserve, that we cut that as well. I will cut the wars. I will stop spending money on the wars. We have people over in Japan. We have people over in Germany that defend wealthy nations today. And you know who pays for it? We pay for it. Everyone is incorrect when they say that cutting taxes creates jobs. That is not the truth. Cutting spending, cutting spending historically is what creates jobs. When you cut taxes and you don't cut spending, we get what we had in the Bush administration, which is what bankrupted our country. Mr. Brown? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we need to do a, a JFK-style across-the-board tax cut for businesses and families that will create jobs. 
we've tried everything already. We've done a stimulus one. Martha's considering a stimulus two. She was in favor of the first one. We're looking at 12 trillion and counting on the, on the, on the national debt. Wouldn't it be nice to maybe try something a little bit different? Because the stimulus bills aren't working, hasn't created one new job. The Senate President will tell you that Governor Patrick has that money. We're 49th out of 50 and actually releasing the money we have. So how can we even talk about another stimulus bill when, we, when the first one hasn't worked? So let's think a little bit differently. Let's go back to basics. We have to uh, hold the line on spending, first, and, first of all, give the President of the line item veto, do a top to bottom review of every federal program and squeeze out any waste like we've done with the Senate President's leadership on those issues. So it's very important to do that. And that's the difference between Martha and me. Her tax proposals will not help at all. They will add to the deficit. The health care bill will add a trillion plus dollars. The cap and trade scheme will increase taxes. The expiring tax has will increase taxes. That's the major differences between Martha and me. Ms. Copeland. David, I think the question was about the deficit. And let's remember the little bit of history here, that when the Democrats less last the presidency before Judge George W. Bush, we were in a pay-as-you-go for spending. You either had to have it in the budget or make sure there was a revenue source for it. That completely went out the window with the Bush-Cheney administration. And so we have deficit spending with reckless spending, unregulated spending, unregulated Wall Street that got us into the problem. And to me, it's astounding that Scott Brown will stand here and say that this problem must have just come out of nowhere, and his solution is to do nothing except to make sure that we um, do some kind of across-the-board tax cut. It's not going to work, and what I've said, and what he knows I've said in the past, is that we need to get tax revenues up. We need to get the engine of this economy running again, get people back to work, get tax how, how revenues would you, how up. How would you get tax revenues up? Are you going to increase taxes? Uh, no, by getting people back to work and by getting people okay. who you, then are will, paying taxes. Will you, uh, President Obama's made the vow, no tax increases on any couple earning less than $250,000. Do you join him in that pledge as yes, senator? I do. You do? And you still think you can balance the budget? Not right away, because we didn't create it overnight. Yeah. This deficit was created by a reckless administration. We got a lot of work to do, including health care costs, energy costs. Those are all complicated problems that have to be addressed. Right. Ms. Brown, you're going to jump in. We have to start dealing in reality, Martha. The, uh, the tax cuts that we're talking about will create an immediate jolt to the economy and create, create jobs. And as JFK called for, Cross the board tax cuts will create jobs. That's not a gimmick, that's reality. And to think that uh, you know, it's all about Bush Cheney, there's plenty of blame to go around. And I'm not going to be you know, living and working on the mistakes of the past. I'm looking to address the mistakes of today. Okay. And, and there, there are real clear differences between the two of us on those very simple issues. And if you think a tax cut is not going to work, then I think you're sadly mistaken. But Mr. Brown, let me, let me ask you both this question now. We, we, we've gone through tax cuts in the Bush years. And uh, we, we did not have this, this booming growth uh, that you've assumed. And, and the Congress has also been afraid, people have been afraid in Washington to take on the entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Now, I want to know if you all are going to have the courage when you go there to take on the entitlement programs, or are we once again, again going to duck and see these costs go through the roof? Well, well, thank I, I'm, I'm the only one here who has talked about spending, and I've done it the entire campaign. You know why? Because spending is something that's difficult to cut. It's difficult to look at all of the people in the audience and say, you know what, we have to cut entitlement programs. And there's a lot of fat that we can trim at the same time. It's just the truth. We have to do it. We can't do it. The reason why nobody wants to talk about cutting spending is because it costs them votes. But you know what? Every single time you go out there and say, oh, I'm going to cut your taxes, right. I'm going to raise your entitlement programs, you're yeah. just lying to get votes. We have to cut spending. I just, I would like Medicare, to know Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, you're ready to cut them? Where would I cut? Okay, first of all. Are you ready to take on the entitlement programs? Yes, I am ready to take on the entitlement programs. Okay, I've said fine, it before. I'll do it again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Senator Gregg has uh, filed a bill that will actually be very similar to the base closure right. bill. Up and down vote. You look at the entitlements. You have a bipartisan commission that will actually look at everything and make a recommendation to, to us. And I look forward to that opportunity to give my input or not. And you would, and that, if that commission came in with tax increases, you would support it? Uh, no, I would not. I think we can do better. I think we, uh, I would uh, not support it, but I would certainly look at entitlements and make that recommendation. At least we have the choice, and that's what that's what's important. Okay. You know, David, we just spent a lot of taxpayer dollars on bailing out big corporations, millions and billions of dollars on TARP and stimulus money, taxpayer dollars that didn't have to be spent if we had done better regulation. So I'm not going to turn around and say, oh, yes, we're going to take away Social Security from our med for 
uh, our greatest generation, for folks with whom we have a contract on, who depend upon that on their prescriptions, there have to be ways that we reach our obligation on that. I, and I, I, I think we have to start with where the blame does fall and how we turn this around. Bottom line, Ms. Coakley, are you, what's your position on whether the Congress ought to consider and be open to reforming Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid in a way that brings down the cost curves in all three programs. I, I, are you opposed to that? Or are believe, you open to that? I believe that everything can be looked at, but I will say this. As I stand here today, I think that if we look at new generations coming in who don't have this entitlement, this is not the first place I am going to look, David, in the economy. Right, but is it a place you're willing to look because that's where the money is? I, I understand that, but there's a good reason for that. And this is about more than just the budget and how we got into the deficit okay. problems, about the obligations we have to our senior citizens and people in this country who depend upon that yeah. for health care. Last comment. Thank you, David. It's not about blame. It's about solving the problems of today. And you have to do a top to bottom review of every federal program to make sure that we can, as the President called for, I actually agreed with him on that, that we do that to find any waste. We've done it here. And we can do it in Washington. We need to start to forget about blaming people. There's plenty to go around. We all know it. Let's f try to f solve the problems of today. And of course, you need to look at entitlements, and you need to look at every other uh, program and project in Washington. All right. Let, let's move on. We, unfortunately, I'd love to stay and, and, and work through a lot of these more deeply, but the, 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 the clock is working in another direction. So I'd, I'd like to go to a new question. And Mr. Brown, this one goes to you for first, and we'll work our way through. The, after the incident with the bomber uh, trying to take down the plane over Detroit, the president declared last week that we are on a war, we're in a war against Al Qaeda. Strong words. How do we win this war, Mr. Brown? Well, thank you. We are in a war. And not only is it coming to our airports and our shopping malls, it's happened here, as you all know, with this, this, the attempt uh, by the person in Sudbury to kill our kids at the mall. Uh, I'm glad he's finally realized that we are at war. He was a little slow, I thought, reacting uh, in that situation. One of the main differences between Martha and me is that uh, she believes that uh, these individuals who, like the Christmas bomber, should be given constitutional rights, attorneys, lawyered up so they can take the fifth and uh, treat them like ordinary criminals. I think they should be treated as enemy combatants. They should be interrogated pursuant to, to the laws of our land and made sure that we find out exactly if there's any other, other, other attacks coming. Uh, that's a, a major difference uh, between Martha and me. Take Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Half a billion dollars it's going to cost. We're giving him constitutional rights. He's taking the fifth. And instead of us getting information from him, he's getting information from us. And Martha agrees with that. I don't. He should be an enemy combatant and treated as such and go through a military tribunal. And we can do better. It's a war that we have to fight. And I'm, with my military experience, uh, and the training that I have in issues of war and peace, I'm looking forward to that opportunity. Ms. Copeland. Thank you. There's nothing more important than keeping this country safe and keeping our homeland security safe and our allies safe. And we need to do it as smartly as we can. We've been at war since 9-11. There's no dispute about that. I've worked as a district attorney and attorney general every day since Columbine, keeping our kids safe since 9-11, working with our federal authorities, our state authorities, our local police fire to make sure that 9-11 never happens again on our soil. And that means that we have to be smarter and we have to work better to use better intelligence and analysis about where Al Qaeda is and how we will neutralize them. And so I'm surprised that Scott, because he is a lawyer and he does defense work uh, for JAG, and I think he understands what constitutional rights are about. I don't think, as one of our Supreme Court justices said, that constitutional rights is a suicide pact. We need to do whatever we can to keep our people safe, and we need to do it in a way that works. And so I think as we move forward, we have to make sure that we have the right intelligence, we move properly, and when we should try people in military tribunals, do that, when we can be very successful as we have been with Thank Richard you. Reed, the shoe bomber, in civilian court. Mr. Kennedy. If we want to, if we want to secure our, if we want to secure the people of America, we have to not say, you know, why are we at war with Al Qaeda? What we need to understand is why is Al Qaeda at war with us? And the reality is, it's because we occupy nations in the Middle East. If you're growing up, if you're a little kid, and you've got somebody from a foreign nation walking up and down your streets with a with a machine gun, you're going to grow up hating that country. You're just going to. And then when you turn 15, 16, 17, it's going to be very easy to recruit you to come over and kill us. That's what's happening. That's what's happened again and again. The reality is, if we want a safer country, what we need to do is we need to not occupy these lands. We need to take and pull back 
the individuals who are deployed over there today. We need to take some of the money that is used to pay for that deployment and use that money internally to secure our borders. If we actually focused on securing America and didn't go over there and interfere in all of these people's lives, we would have fewer enemies and we would be concentrating our forces where we need them, which is in America. Mr. Pratt. Thank you, uh, Martha. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you recognize my service. I'm a lieutenant colonel with 30 years in the military, uh, infantry quartermaster, and now I'm a JAG, and I do deal on these issues. And I don't recall any time that we've given constitutional rights to terrorists uh, that, are that we're only entitled to here as United States citizens. To, to think that we would give people who want to kill us constitutional rights and lawyer them up at our expense instead of treating them as enemy combatants to get as much information as we can under legal means, it just makes no sense to me. And it, it shows me that you don't quite understand the law when it comes to enemy combatants versus terrorists versus United States citizens. Ms. Coakley. If I can respond, the reason that we started the designation of enemy combatants is so that we would have rules and regulations for our own soldier safety to make sure that we treated people appropriately. And we still and always will have the option, if it makes more sense, to get better information and better intelligence to treat people right. in the military enemy combatant uh, forum. I, I understand your differences on the legal treatment of prisoners. What I'd like to understand, and I don't, is how you would win the war on the ground. Thank you. May I? Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I agree with the President. That's another difference between Martha and me. I support his effort to uh, finish the job in Afghanistan. We need to provide the tools and resources to the men and women, number one, to keep them safe. Uh, number two, the President thought after four months what he would need to do to finish the job. And the job is what? It's to make sure that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda do not get nuclear weapons and, uh, and export them around the world. It's pretty simple. And how do you do it? You make sure that we support our troops and we support our president, unlike Martha, at a time of, of war. We are at war. We're at war at our airports. We're at war at our shopping malls. And I have to be honest with you folks, and as you're listening, I am, uh, I'm scared at some of the policies that I've heard in your treatment of giving uh, enemy combatants constitutional rights and clamming them up. I want to know when the next terrorist strike is going to happen, and we're not going to find it by the policies that you're pushing, number one. And I support the President, and I'm proud to do so. Ms. Coakley. Uh, just in response to that, certainly we've had over almost 200 trials, civilian trials, that have been successful in holding people accountable when they have been designated by the Bush Cheney administration as enemy combatants and put in Guantanamo. They've made that decision. Presumably, the Attorney General can do that too and will do that. I don't agree with President Obama's decision to send troops. Um, to Afghanistan. And so, uh, as a side note, you know, Scott selectively picks and chooses whatever he thinks is right, apparently is the right policy Th for this the country. Country, how, how do you think we then succeed in I, Afghanistan? In Afghanistan, yes, in I Pakistan. think we have done what we are going to be able to do in Afghanistan. You think we should come home? I think we should plan an exit strategy, yes. And how, then how would we succeed? I, I'm, I, I'm not sure there is a way to succeed. If the goal was, and the mission in Afghanistan was to go in because we believed that the Taliban was giving harbor to terrorists. We supported that. I supported that goal. They're gone. They're not there anymore. They're in apparently Yemen. They're in Pakistan. Let's focus yeah. our efforts well, on where Al Qaeda is and not always decide. Which, that we would need you to then send troops into Yemen where Al Qaeda no, is? No, that's the, exactly the point. This is not about sending troops everywhere we think Al Qaeda may be or where they're training. We have all kinds of resources at our disposal, including CIA. Our, our allies who work with us, and the focus should be getting the appropriate information on individuals who are trained, who represent a threat to us, and use the force necessary to go after those individuals. Yeah. Excuse, excuse one, me. One brief intervention, we're going to close, uh, move on. Th thank you. Let me explain once again what the mission is. The mission is to make sure that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda do not join forces, move on Pakistan, go get nuclear weapons, and export them around the world, number one. And to think that uh, Al-Qaeda is not everywhere we're talking about, and we should not be going and addressing these very real concerns, I think is naive. Uh, we have some real problems. In fairness, Ms. Cook, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I think it's naive to think that we have the troops to send everywhere, and they are the best way to go after people who are terrorists, who disappear into the night, who do trainings, and who get on planes frankly, with bombs in their shoes and other pieces of clothing. Excuse and so, me, what, uh, excuse me, one second. Let's, let's be clear who's but, naive. But then you're saying that once we catch these people, uh, we're going to be giving them constitutional That's rights. That's not what and I said, okay. Scott. That's you, not what you, I said. You've, we're you've talking about ground You, you support uh, Sheik, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed getting an attorney. The, the bomber in Christmas, you said that that is okay. He should be, you know, lawyered up, and you didn't disagree with that. 
it, we should have taken the time and interrogated him properly to find out what's next. And, we and, apparently and, have information from yeah, him. He I'll tell you what, guys. you or I know what that is. I'll, I'll tell you what, this, this, this is very constructive now, but we're going we're gonna to change the format a little bit and you can keep talking. And that is we're going to allow each candidate, this is unusual, allow each candidate a chance to ask the other two candidates a question and get a, a minute long response. We'll start with Ms. Coakley. She'll have a chance to ask Mr. Brown a question and Mr. Kennedy a question. And somehow I think it may be a continuation of what they've been talking about. I'm not sure. Or maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, Scott, in Massachusetts, you've supported legislation that would allow hospital employees to deny emergency care to rape victims uh, if it was their choice. Uh, you have also, in this campaign, received the endorsement of the Massachusetts Right to Life organization that said you will be a vote uh, for right to life, a vote for, for life in the Senate. Um, do you accept their endorsement or do you disavow that? Well, first of all, thank you for your question. Um, I have a very big 10. I, I appreciate everybody's support because this isn't about Democrats, Republicans, and independents. It's about everybody, and I welcome everybody's support, as you do as well. You have many special interest groups support. They're rallying around you right now as part of the machine to do just that. And yes, I did uh, vote on a bill to allow uh, women who are raped to get a treatment. I supported that, and I'm very proud of that vote. And you and I both have the same position on, uh, on abortion. It's Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, uh, yet we have a very real difference. And the difference is, I'm against partial birth abortion, you're not. I don't believe, it's not right. well, Martha, with all due respect, you wrote an editorial that anyone can go online and find when you, you actually criticize uh, partial birth abortion, the fact that it's, in fact, not allowed. And we also have uh, a difference in that I don't believe that federal funding of abortion should be allowed, and I believe in a very uh, strong parental consent notification law. As somebody who's being supported by EMILY's list, you will go down there as a social crusader to file the bills as you're obligated to, as everybody else who's supported by them is. I want to be a jobs crusader. I don't want to be a social crusader. I want to deal on the issues that are very important to us. And to think that I, I would even, especially with my two young daughters here, with all due respect, to think that I wouldn't allow them the opportunity if they were raped to have the uh, immediate attention, I think, is abhorrent. Even well, to am I wrong in what that me, bill even allows to infer, Yeah, yeah. Uh, even to infer. It's, time is up. Even and, to and infer Coakley, that I would do that. You, you, given that what had just been said, I think you should have an appropriate time to respond, and then you have a chance to ask. Ask. Thank you. Am I wrong, Scott, that the bill you filed allows for emergency personnel to deny care if it's in within their yes, decision? Yes, you're absolutely wrong. It was an amendment. I'm wrong or I'm you, right? You're abs you, you are wrong. It's what does that amendment do? If I could, I'm not in your courtroom, I'm not a defendant, right? so let, let me answer the question. The amendment that you're referring to allowed hospitals who had religious preferences not to perform abortions or provide those services. Emergency the, contraception. Once again, I'm not a defendant. I'd like to have a chance to answer yeah. the question. And in fact, I did vote for the ultimate bill. That was an amendment filed and supported by many people. The bill passed. I was proud to vote for it. We'd do it again. Okay. And you think it's it's a correct it's a correct position to take. I just want to be clear. To, to, allow, women to, to, to allow women to get a, an emergency contraceptive if they've been raped, yes, I believe that's a correct position. And, okay. and, and they can be turned away okay. if it's up to an individual. Ms. It's okay. abhorrent that you would even try to twist this bill around. I think you need to read the bill again, Martha. We would, we would love another hour, but we, we need to keep moving. We will. And, and Ms. Coakley, I've yes. just been informed, given the time constraints, yes. we're going to move to one question. I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Kennedy if he would pose a question to either one of the two candidates. Um, okay. Uh, Ms. Coakley, a very simple question for you. Uh, we have a health care bill in front of us that will cost $1.2 trillion. Right now, the total amount of money that is raised on a yearly basis by all tax taxes that come in via the federal income tax is at $1.08 trillion. So this is over a 10-year period. Are you willing to increase taxes on everyone 11% to pay for this health care bill because that's what it costs and it won't be able to be done by just taxing the wealthy. No, because I disagree with the premises and the facts in your question, Joe. I appreciate that. I think everybody appreciates that health care needs reform and that it's complicated and we can stand here all night and throw numbers around and argue about it, but what it requires is getting down and figuring out as we did in Massachusetts and we look at costs and as we go forward on the national level, we can't afford not to do health care reform. So we can figure out how we have to pay for it, what we will save by early prevention, early screenings, 
the ways in which we turn around how we pay for these services. We pay far too much for the results that we get in health care. Just, just to go on the record, the numbers that I'm giving you are numbers from the government. They're from the Tax Foundation. So and, they're, they're and, and the Congressional Budget Office says that within 10 years it will be deficit neutral. It'll be budget neutral. And we will see the kinds of things that we want out of this, not just these dollars and cents on this side of the ledger. We will see people who now don't have insurance get it so the cost will be down. They won't be in the emergency rooms. We'll see the people who pay out of their pockets to get screenings that insurance companies won't pay for. And then they need less invasive procedures, as a friend of mine found out. So the insurance company saves money on her while she pays $3,000 for a screening test. Our system is upside down, it's wrongheaded, and it doesn't take care of the people that it's supposed to. And we can do it, get better results, and save money. We're not going to do it overnight. I agree with that. Okay. Mr. Brown, you have a chance to ask one of the candidates' questions. I can't, I can't <laughs> guess which candidate it might be. All right, I'll, <laughs> tell, I'll tell you. It'll be Martha. Uh, <laughs> Martha, we, we're both good people. That's the consensus on the trail. We just have uh, differences, many differences. Uh, I happen to think you're wrong in the policies. And one of them is this issue on terror. You want to provide uh, constitutional rights to enemy combatants and treat them like ordinary criminals. And uh, I don't. A little bit of a difference. Uh, simple question. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, has been, uh, it will be tried in New York and at taxpayer expense. And you've supported that. You've made that very public. He, uh, if in fact he's found guilty of killing uh, almost 3,000 innocent men, women, and children, uh, should he get the death penalty? He will get the death penalty if no, he's do, found guilty. Do you think that he should, do you agree with the fact that he will, he should get the death penalty? Yes, because that's what the federal law says right now. But you've come out very strongly saying you do not support the death penalty. I've said I don't support it personally. I think it has its limitations. I'm not in favor of it. I wouldn't vote for it, but I understand that he's being tried now in federal court because he wasn't tried in a military tribunal as he sat in Guantanamo. I've said it's the attorney general's decision on where to try him. We've done it successfully many times. As I mentioned earlier, Shoe Bomber Richard Reed, over uh, almost 200 civilian trials decided by prior attorneys general under the Republican administration, and they've made a decision that this is where to go. It's their decision to make. If he's found guilty, uh, and I believe he will be, and he's facing all kinds of charges. He's not going to be walking down the streets of Manhattan. He will face the death penalty. That's what the law of the okay. land is, and I would support the law of the land, uh, he even was, though I right. disagree okay. with the he was treated as He was treated as an enemy combatant initially. Then why didn't they and bring he, him to, to justice me, in the military and tribunal? He actually was interrogated and found valuable information by taking the shoe bomber and, and lawyer him, lawyering him up at our expense, knock that all off. And, uh, it's problematic, and that's another difference. Let's move on to the next round. I'm going to come back and ask the candidates a couple of more questions, rounds of questions, uh, and then we're going to have time for closing statements. But I would like to ask each of you, this time it will be directed individually to you. And I'd like to raise some concerns that have been out there on the campaign trail, starting with you, Mr. Brown. If you could answer, answer a couple of questions. There are those who argue that you've been campaigning as a moderate Republican, more in the Bill Weld mold. Uh, mold, but that in fact you're quite conservative on some issues. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Roe v. Wade, you said that is the law of the land. You respect it, but you've been endorsed by right to life groups uh, who are campaigning for you. Would your preference be to see Roe v. Wade overturned? Is that your preference? No. <laughs> I, mean, I think people, and, and I know you're not from this area, but I have a long history of service as an assessor, selectman, state rep, state senator, 30 years in the military. I live in a house full of women that I'm very proud of. And uh, to try to have people twist my record around. I just, are you, do you support Roe v. Wade? That's never been clear. That's never been an issue. It's always been the case. You do support it. All right. Okay. Let me ask you a second question. Uh, that is the question on, on climate change. You were uh, recently quoted in the newspapers as someone asked you whether climate change uh, was a big fraud. And you essentially said, let's wait and see, as if we don't have enough information. Do you believe that uh, climate, global warming, is caused by man-made activities, or are you skeptical? Well, first of all, that's not an accurate quote. And uh, secondly, the climate's changing all the time. Martha and I agree on that. It's just a question of what we do uh, with regard to it. Do we do a tax and, and, and uh, cap well, and trade let, scheme? Let me just quote it back. You well, said, the question was, do you think that whole global warming thing is a big fraud? You responded, it's interesting. I think the globe is always heating and cooling. You went on to say you need more accurate information. Uh, I, once again, it's not accurate. What That's I said. What was reported in the newspapers. Well, the newspapers. What paper okay. are you talking about? Okay. I, 
I'm going to tell you what my position is right now. Okay. The, the uh, climate is always changing. It, it always has. And uh, there's a question of whether it's man-made or natural. And it's probably a combination of, the, of both. But right now, how do we address it? That's, that's the key. I think you're asking how do we address it. And we need to make sure we do a, a bunch of things. Conservation, wind, solar, hydroelectric, nuclear. When's the last time we, we built a nuclear power plant to step back from our dependence on fossil fuel? The difference between Martha Coakley on this important issue is in the midst of a recession, she is in favor of a cap and trade scheme that's going to make energy costs skyrocket pursuant to the president. So yes, the climate is changing to answer your questions. I don't care how it's changing. I want to make sure that we address right. the fact that we can step back from the usage of fossil fuels. It's pretty simple. Okay, Ms. Coakley. Uh, there are, are some who wondered whether you've, um, as a front runner, been a little, sometimes been a little complacent, uh, and but that you're now sort of catching fire. And uh, I, I wonder, uh, in looking back, whether you think it was the right decision to, to insist on three people in a debate, given the fact when John Kerry campaigned for this office, he said, no, I'll do it one-on-one. -on -one. When Teddy Kennedy campaigned for this office, he said, no, I'll do it one-on-one. -on -one. What about you? I, I think it was a very good decision. And I think that Joe, as you can see tonight, has added a lot to the debate, has mm -hmm. added a lot to the discussion. And the position has always been, as I'm familiar with debates here in Massachusetts, is that people who are on the ballot should be able to get up when it's a public sponsored debate and have voters judge them as they would Scott or me or anyone else who gets the signatures to get on the ballot. We've had plenty of opportunities, you can see tonight, to go one-on-one -on, -one on issues. <laughs> there are lots of ways in which voters they get to compare us, but in a public forum sponsored on television that everyone has access to, I think it makes a lot of sense. As you look back on the campaign, do you have any second thoughts about the way the campaign's unfolded? Absolutely not. You know, campaigns uh, are not dress rehearsals. They move forward at their own pace and dynamic. We had a tough primary. We worked hard every day on that in many ways. We're doing the same thing in this. We're taking nothing for granted. We've worked very hard. I did take Christmas Day off. I think voters probably didn't want to hear from me on Christmas Day <laughs> or Christmas <laughs> Eve. Um, but to suggest that somehow I'm taking this for granted or not working hard, you can look at our policy papers on the website. You can look at our volunteers. You can look at the phone calling. I don't know what's going to happen on January 19th, but I'm asking voters to vote for one of the three of us, hopefully me, and I'm working very hard day and night as my campaign and all our volunteers are to make sure we get our message out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, briefly, uh, uh, you've, you've run a, a tough, hard campaign, but you're in a situation now where you're coming down to the final days and you're still pretty far back. If you were not to win, do you have a preference between these two candidates as to which one you would like to see win? <laughs> so, so in all honesty, I think that the most important thing here, and, and I'll, I will answer your question. Um, yeah. uh, I think the most the most important thing that we that we do here as a third party candidate is to get the message out. None of these two candidates has been willing to talk about spending, and if they can't talk about spending, then we can't really have any intelligent discussions around the economy. And essentially, I will wait, you know, my answer would be whoever can actually start talking about cutting of spending. Uh, neither one of them has been willing to do so, but who I would support would be the person who, whenever they decide to, starts being realistic about what's going on with the economy and talk about cutting spending. In terms of answering the question, do you have one that's closer to your model than the other? Uh, I, I honestly think that Scott at least uh, talks about cutting taxes, um, which is part of the way there. My, my issue with Scott is essentially that last year he had the opportunity when we had the referendum to cut the income tax. He's been calling for across the board tax, uh, tax cut we had the opportunity last year. He publicly came out against it, and it was voted down. That's $3,700 that could have gone out to everybody, and he voted it down. A year later, now that he's running, he's calling for the exact same thing that he didn't want to have a year ago in the same economic conditions. How do voters trust it? I don't know. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to turn to one final question to each of you, and then you'll have a chance for a closing statement. Uh, and this, this is about, uh, it's, it's more personal in nature, and that is, uh, as in traveling state and talking to people in the press, talking to voters, uh, there is a common refrain that is that people sense they knew Senator Ted Kennedy very well as a human being. He was senator for a long time. He had a chance to get to make a lot of personal connections. And they've, they, they have a lot of respect for the three of you. They all think you're nice people, but they don't sense they know you very well. And they've, they've had a hard time penetrating. Could you tell us, uh, uh, getting beyond what you've said in your, in your advertising and your stump speeches, could you give us a sort of a personal insight into what you would like 
the voters to go into the polls thinking who you are as, as a person, starting with Ms. Coakley. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, David, and part of it is we are constrained by these yeah. forums. You know, I'm pleased, my husband Tom is here with me tonight, my sister Mary, my sister Anne, my brother-in-law Kevin, my nephew Joe. Um, I come from a big family. My mother was the youngest of 10. I grew up in Western Massachusetts. My dad owned his old insurance agency and actually didn't have much use for politics. Um, but I think he'd be proud of the work I've done. I am driven by um, the work that I do, passionate for victims, domestic violence, kids, keeping them safe, understanding how we do that. I do take my work very seriously, but as those who know me well, I don't take myself so seriously. I can be funny, believe it or not, um, <laughs> even though uh, most people don't think they're that. They're laughing. And they're laughing, because they, they, they know. Um, but I enjoy um, my life outside. I love to cook, I love to downhill ski. I've got two great labs. Uh, I really feel very blessed that I get to work every day on behalf of the public uh, and have a great personal life with a tremendous husband who loves me. Uh, I think I'm very lucky. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy. Um, so, I think that it's best to state that I'm very close to my, my family. Uh, my father's a minister. I grew up in an adopted family. Uh, and the, I think the best thing that people under, should understand is when I called my father up and told him what I was going to do here, the words out of his mouth were, oh, no, I'm very proud of you. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I told him why I was doing it. And I, I think that people need to understand that the reason why I'm doing this I don't get anything out of this. This, is a, this would be a pay cut for me. This is, the, the press has been you know, uh, less than fair. Uh, the amount of time that I get on stage is usually less than fair. This is very difficult for a third party candidate to do. But the reality is the message has to get out there. And I would risk every single thing that I do on a day to day basis to make sure that somebody's actually supporting the people of the state of Massachusetts. Because when I look at the taxes that I pay at the end of the, when I look at the taxes that, the, that I pay at the end of the day, I see that they have to be cut because I support a family and everybody else here does too. Okay. Mr. Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank you both for participating. I want to thank uh, you for having this as well and being here, David. I'm hopeful that uh, people will get to know me more than the Globe and the other media outlets have portrayed uh, me. Uh, they've done a pretty good job, uh, but there's a lot more. And uh, it's kind of hard to talk about, but this race has made me reflect. Uh, didn't come from a lot of, a lot of money. Uh, my, my parents had divorced a few times. My mom was on welfare for a period of time. And I really came from nothing. And I've worked my way up. And I have two beautiful daughters, a loving wife of 23 years. And I've been serving this uh, state, the state that I love, that I was, I was raised here. And I, I would probably die here. And the thing that I have loved about this race is the, the fact that I've been able to travel all around the state and meet some great people, see some great businesses, and know what their, their needs and hurts are. And, uh, it's made me appreciate and love this state and this country even more. And I'm hopeful that people will appreciate that fact and they'll appreciate my service not only as a municipal and legislative leader, but also in, in my military service. And I'm hoping they give me a chance to uh, go to Capitol Hill and try to fix what's wrong there. Thank you. We'll now turn to closing statements. The order has been determined by lottery. And first, we'll go to Ms. Coakley. Thank you, David. And thanks again for hosting us tonight. I'm asking for voters on January 19th to vote for me for U.S. Senate because we need to send somebody to Washington who will address these difficult problems and get results. I've done that as your attorney general, as, your, as a district attorney in Middlesex County. Uh, I know that the economy uh, needs regulations, and I know that we need to get people back to work and bring jobs here. I know how to do that, and I intend to do that. And I appreciate um, the kinds of um, ideas that Joe Kennedy has brought to this, because as my friend uh, Jerry Brown, Attorney General in California, said, we've all been spending too much money we don't have on stuff we don't need. And that is true of us individually, and that is true of us as a government. That doesn't mean, however, that there aren't very important things and things that we have to spend our money on to keep our kids safe, to keep our families safe. I will do that. I brought back a billion dollars as Attorney General for consumers. That's my first priority, making sure we use our money smartly and that we keep our people safe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Brown. David, thank you to you for coming out, and thank you for all of you for being such good sports, and, and thank you to our viewers for participating. I'm so honored to be on the stage with Martha and Joe, and I'm honored to even be considered to be the next United States Senator for this great state. Uh, there's nothing more that I would like to do than represent you in Washington, as I've done here in West Massachusetts. Uh, as a lieutenant colonel and 30-year member of the Army National Guard, I understand the differences between the candidates on terror. I support the president and his efforts to keep us safe, and I think I could bring that expertise to Washington and help. 
Uh, with regard to taxes, I've been fighting that battle on Beacon Hill. I've looked to cut. I've looked to hold the line on taxes uh, that the Governor Patrick and, and the, the political machine are pushing on us. It's happening in Washington. Washington is starting to act like Massachusetts in that regard, taxing before saving. And I think we can do better. As the 41st Senator, I can go down there and at least bring conversation back. It's broken. It's broken like it's here in Massachusetts broken, and it's broken in Washington. As the 60th Senator, Martha, debate will be cut off. And that's not good for democracy. That's not what our founding fathers wanted. And I'm hopeful that I get the opportunity on January 19th. And I appreciate everybody being here. And I appreciate what you've done, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy. David, thank you uh, for moderating this evening. And thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, this election, a uh, week from now, is really about the economy and about the future. This is about big government candidates against a small government candidate. And what you really need to ask yourself is, Scott will spend money on war. Martha will spend money on health care. But the reality is, who do you want to spend your money? Do you want the government to spend your money? Or do you want to make those decisions for yourself? I will, I'm the only candidate that will go out there and I will cut spending. I will repeal Obamacare. I will file legislation to end the wars. And I will bring that money back to the people of Massachusetts and the rest of the country. I will audit the Federal Reserve. I'm the only candidate that is willing to cut the spending. You have to ask yourself, who do you want spending your money? Do you want it to be the government, or do you want to make those decisions yourself? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes tonight's debate, the final debate before the election next Tuesday. Uh, as we leave, I'd like to thank, if we might, the Edward M. Kennedy Institute uh, uh, of the United States Senate for, host, for sponsoring this debate. And I'd like to thank the University of Massachusetts at Boston uh, for hosting this event. I'd like to thank our media partners who've been covering this. Uh, eight television stations, three radio stations, the biggest gathering in memory, and for a reason, because this election is so close. I'd like to urge all of you, if you have the moment, and to do this, given what they've put into it, to go vote. Encourage all of it. everybody here who's involved with this would like to encourage you to vote. This is an important election. And now, if you would, I'd like to ask if you would join me in thanking the candidates who've come here tonight and who are so devoted to public service. Thank you, one and all. <laughs>